Before we get into this week's podcast, got to tell you about the people that make this show and Godzilla Media possible, like our friends over at Mohawk Honda. If you're looking for a new vehicle, the place you want to go is Glenville, New York, to trade in your ride. The supply chain this summer continues to be bizarre, strange, like not seen, not, nothing we've ever seen before, right? Mohawk Honda wants to help you trade in your vehicle, walk away with money in your pocket, and a new ride. I know from experience, 2022 Pilot EXL sitting in my driveway right now. You can have the same regular rate of having a new car in your driveway by heading over to Mohawk Honda. Work with people that you can trust during the car buying experience. It's so important. You don't want to hear the horror stories your friends and family members have told you. Go somewhere where you can trust the people and you're going through the process of finding a new ride. And then we'll get you what fits your style, your overall lifestyle, whatever it might be, whatever you're looking for, whether it's Greg Johnson, Cam McKenna, Brian McKenna, Lindsay Heron, and our guy, John and service, the VIP man, Morales, MJ. I can run through a ton of more names of the people I've met in the Mohawk family. Now you can meet them too. Mohawk Honda, Glenville, New York. Stop in, get yourself a new vehicle, money in your pocket, and more. When you head in there, tell me you heard about it. Godzilla Media, Mohawk Honda, where they always go out of their way to please you. And our friends over at Johnstone Supply in Troy, it has been a hot summer here in upstate New York. Hopefully, you've been staying cool, but if you continue to push it off, the place you can get your AC unit is Johnstone Supply in Troy, 518 272 5922. 518 Two seven two five nine two two. That is the number to Johnstone Supply in Troy, where you can get yourself a new AC unit. Or if you just had issues around your home and you're looking for a professional to work with, fix it, a furnace, a boiler, whatever it might be, they want to help you fix those problems in your home today. One more time for the number five one eight two seven two five nine two two. Or check them out on Facebook, Johnstone Supply and Why. They're on social media. Leave them a nice note. Hey, love everything you do across the capital region and upstate New York. Happy you have somebody in our hometown, in our spot to help people across different homes, cities, whatever it might be. Shout out to George and Kev and Fish and everybody over there at Johnstone Supply in Troy. By the way, if you're working on that summer project, you've been putting it off, you need those affordable tools, Johnstone Supply has that in store. Weekdays, they're open. Stop into 6th Avenue in Troy. Say hello to all those guys. And also, Godzilla Media is the spot where you found Shout out to our guy, Sean, man, who gave us a shout out. Johnstone Supply stopped over. Johnstone Supply in Troy. All right. On to this Godzilla Media podcast. Let's start for what might be the final time we talk about these guys for a while. And that is the 2022 National Arena League champion, Albany Empire. One of the great performances in the history of indoor football defensively. From the first quarter all the way midway to the fourth quarter, The Carolina Cobras didn't score a touchdown. Albany rolls in the National Arena League Championship. Back-to-back in the first professional sports franchise to win back-to-back championships in this history of Albany, New York. Let's sit on that for a second because wherever you're listening across upstate New York, whether it's Rochester, Utica, Watertown, Syracuse, it's not known as a professional sports area most cities in upstate New York. Look, Buffalo is, of course, but the Bills haven't won. Sorry, Bills Mafia. The Sabres haven't won. Buffalo is still looking to break through. When you get to downstate in the city, yeah, we get the Yankees and the Rangers and the Knicks. The Knicks haven't won, but you get downstate, you know there's been more success professionally. But then look across upstate New York. What is the next best professional city? Well, Rochester's got St. John Fisher and U of R. Hobart in Keuka out in the Finger Lakes. Watertown's got Jefferson Community County, but a lot of those fans are fans of Syracuse. They just are. From 45 minutes to a half hour to an hour away, people embrace the Syracuse community. Of course, they're in central New York. That's a college town. So Albany is the next biggest pro town market it is. You Albany football, even though it's having success at the FCS level, is still not drawing the crowds besides the homecoming burn game that they hope to. Siena basketball has had the same consistent crowd, it seems like, for 30 years, but it's been a while since the Saints have been a team in the NCAA tournament. At one point, there was talks of them being the next Gonzaga. That hasn't happened that way. Now, look, Union Hockey gets a crowd and other lacrosse programs like you Albany do, but this is a pro town. Since I moved out to the Capital Region 70 years ago, the biggest crowds that I've seen have been four professional sporting events. The Albany Empire, the Premier Lacrosse League, Valley Cat Games, 
It is a pro town. When professional sports come to the capital region, people take notice. I told you last week that this game was more about the legacy of the Albany Empire, how people will look at the franchise for the future, how they'll view these players and think, oh, oh, they're winning. Oh, it's still fun football. Oh, it's a local owner. It's so frustrating, man. In the capital region, this has been one of the most frustrating weeks I think of my career. Seriously, like of the last seven years, to open up here a little bit. I was texting Levesque and our guy Boston Dan about some of the stuff that was happening here locally. I'll just call the guy out, right? Why not? It's a late night too. Ken Schott, who works for the Daily Gazette, I swear to God, wrote an article that said "shot on career move." He wrote an article as if the person in the article was a different person, and underneath it says, "I examine his sports writing career." As if he was interviewing someone else, referring to himself. Oh my God, dude. That happened. Uh, my old buddies over at 104.5, the team wrote a story about birds. That's right. Rather than the Empire, we need a championship. They wrote about birds. There's other outlets. Uh, Mark Singlace wrote about practice. It was just so thirsty. I wanted sports. I wanted to talk about things happening in the capital region. I wanted to have an impact. Thank goodness we had the Albany Empire. Because if I'm feeling like that for somebody who does this as a profession, I can only imagine how sports fans in the area feel when they're getting that type of content day in and day out. Nonsense in this area. Thank you, Albany. That next summer we can talk about you. Yeah, we can always talk about Saratoga. Look, the race fan, it's an event. Niche, we can always talk about that. It's like a niche horse racing fans, but more horse racing fans in the area when it comes to the summer. But thank goodness we have the Albany Empire, where we can talk about winning, talk about athletes, talk about people who care about it, man, the engagement, and the views, and the excitement for the fans there. That's what that means. An expanded National Arena League, eight teams next season, fans knowing that these players are going to stick around. That's what this championship was about. The legacy, the future, what it can mean for the rest of the Capital Region summers to come. Thank you to Mike Corda, my guy Jeff Levesque. For giving Capital Region sports fans something to talk about, cheer about, and go out and watch locally. Because trust me, there are some dog days of summer here in local sports. And luckily we've had the Empire to give us something to really appreciate when it comes to being competitive, high-level, entertaining sports. Oh my god, the Yankees are so bad all of a sudden. What the hell happened? Like, I didn't think I was going to have to do a Yankees peak too soon or let's not freak out because I... I've done this for seven, eight, nine, ten years about a Yankee fan freaking out. Now, usually it happens like late May, early June. The Yankee freak out. Usually like on a Tuesday or a Wednesday, right? Where the content's a little slower in New York. Oh, my God. Who should Brian Cashman trade for at the end of the world? Ah! We didn't get that until August. And even though it seems like a dead of a horse storyline and just a needed content creator at times for the Yankees, they really suck right now. Only three combined wins in the month of August when we're taping this. That the Yankees, arguably the best team in baseball at one point, have been able to figure out that's post-deadline as if the team got worse and worse. By the way, the Yankees pulled that one out in the 10th inning tonight on a walk-off. So I had the fourth win there. There you go. Shows you how late we're taping this one tonight. What, what happened? They went back-to-back -back games where they got shut out. They got shut out in the Bronx for the first time in nine years, so the offense can't click anymore. I know Stanton's out. I know they can get healthier. I know they still got some players coming back. The talk is that they want to bring up Esteban Floreal from the Miners. Aaron Hicks can't hit. I like the idea, though. Even though I'm a Tim LeCastro fan, shout-out to the Syracuse Junior Chiefs. Shout-out to D3 Baseball in Ithaca. Floreal might be the difference. Can he? Can he be? Right? From the days of Gary Sanchez to Aaron Judge, I think about Yasiel Puig years ago with the Los Angeles Dodgers. We could run through a list of Manny Machado for the Orioles back in the mid-2010 decade. That there were call-ups and moves for potential playoff teams and contenders that changed the locker room. A young spark. We've seen more recently trains being the reason as to why some of the teams have success. But if I'm a Yankee fan, that's about as good as I can give you for what can get fixed here. Because you're post-deadline, you're not making a move. There's nobody in the order that I'm screaming he has to sit besides Aaron Hicks because he stinks. You just got to hit the baseball. That's it. Like, you got to put offense back up. You got to find ways to get runners to move again. Like you, And it almost feels like, oh, no well, no shit, guys. You think the Yankees got to score runs to win games? Yes, but like this was such an obvious thing for five months. 
but they had one of the best offenses. They had multiple guys cashing in. By the way, that term, cashing in, I want to make that a drinking game on CBS because I feel like I've used that like five times this week anytime anybody scores. So there's your first cash in here. There's the ultimate crutch of the month of August. The Yankees not hitting and me saying that on every 11 o'clock sports update. But this is the Yankee team you're getting. The American League, you've got Houston that's really good. Baltimore, yeah, shout out to Baltimore being talked about now. The Rays are beating you. The Blue Jays are falling back a bit. What's the Central going to look like? The Guardians going to make a leap up there? They got enough in the tank? It still feels like a two-horse race here between New York and Houston. Seattle can maybe finally break their curse. Simple as this, hit the baseball. Bring somebody up to the minors to create a spark in the lineup. Yankee fan, relax on social media. It's not an Aaron Boone. Ah, I've been waiting all season. Let me get Boone. Ah, this is my moment. Got a really good year. It's a 162-game season. You've got a huge lead in the American League East. Nobody's catching you. Find offense. Get healthy. That's how you fix the Yankees. The New York Jets have been getting a lot of love on this podcast, man. New York Jets. Jet fans, we gave you love for the training camp. We talked about Robert Sala and what it could mean. And now I'm on a weekend night, Zach Wilson injured in a preseason game. The biggest talk of anybody. I, I gave the Jets love about being the most entertaining, most interesting team for me in the training camp of how Coach Sala and these rookies and these three first rounders are going to come together. And now the quarterback gets hurt on a non-contact drill and you wonder, oh, it's a torn ACL, right? Anybody who wanted to go on social media and just tweet out torn ACL, their Twitter started to light up. I saw one guy just report it. Didn't care. Reports are telling us he's a torn ACL. He got more engagement, retweets, than anything else. Than anybody he just made it up. I mean, everything about making stuff up and getting reactions. and just finished up the Manti Teo doc on Netflix. I don't want to ruin it for anybody, so we won't do it on this one. But man, that was fantastic. But Zach Wilson now two to four weeks. Month? possibly the Jets getting him against the Baltimore Ravens. That game is likely going to be taken off the line. If you like Baltimore and you're survivor bull, you might like them even more now. But what's the true impact of Zach Wilson? That's what I've been struggling with to figure out this week. He's your team starting quarterback who's a former first-round draft. The answer should be he should be the leader of the team better than any other option on the roster and potentially be a quarterback not just for the next two years, but for years to come if he's good enough. That's what you do with first-rounders, of course. Is he one win different? Two? Zero? I swear I wish I had war stats in football. Also feel like punters and kickers would get a lot more love in war, especially guys like Justin Tucker in this stat. You got Joe Flacco. Jimmy Garoppolo is going to be out there somewhere. I'm not saying you should hope Zach Wilson gets hurt. Absolutely not. But the freak out, oh my God, the sky's falling, the season's over. I could feel that way in Kansas City or Buffalo, maybe even Green Bay with an older Aaron Rodgers, but not here. Not the New York Jets with the expectations of the season might have been playoffs, but more likely than not, not going to be a playoff team for how competitive the AFC is. If you look at the AFC right now, can't you make an argument that 13 teams cannot just make the playoffs but win the Super Bowl? Those three teams that probably can are the Texans. I wouldn't give them credit that they can go that far this season. Uh, and then you struggle, right? Are the Jets that other team? So the Texans and the Jets? So they 14 teams in the AFC can make a run this season? Colts got an easy schedule. Titans have been there before. They're the top seed last year. Jacksonville? Okay. I'll give you, I'll give you a 13, like I said with it before. So there you go, New York fans. You get Zach Wilson back. Of course, your team's better with him behind center, but the impact of him going down is not derailing the season because that's way too much credit to give Wilson. If Wilson came off an 11 and 6, and it's still weird to do that 17 math for those numbers, if Wilson came off an 11 and 6 season and threw for 4,000 yards and 30 plus touchdowns, they'd be like, okay. Yeah, they're not it yet. He hasn't. And the guy you replaced them with, the rumors are coming out that Sam Darnold's not going to be the starter in Carolina. So your quarterback position hasn't been good. Joe Flacco is elite. I just wanted to sneak that in. It is great news. I know I'm going to sound like I'm talking down two sides of my mouth. It is good, great news that Wilson can play at the start of the season. But let's not make a quarterback better because he got hurt. Let's not act like he was going to lead this team to an AFC title game like Coach Rex Ryan did a decade plus ago now. There's still a lot to get worked on when it comes to Zach Wilson. And Jet Finn, you know this. I have to remind you, but I'll do it. 
a quarterback shown they're the quarterback of the future yet. So until I see that, I'm not going to have a meltdown about what could have been or will be for the quarterback under center. LeBron James just signed a two-year, 90-plus million-dollar extension with the Lakers. Now, I'm not going to do six minutes on LeBron and the, who's the GOAT and Jordan and everything else. However, I do want to share a story. I don't think I've ever told anybody, maybe maybe truly anybody, this story involving LeBron and in these takes and these conversations. This is a true story. So my buddies in Solomon remember this. Uh, we'd go to the fights for boxing at Turningstone Casino. And maybe we'd just hang out at the casino. This might have not even been a boxing night. This might have been when I was probably 2015. Yeah, so uh, there's this website. This is a little getting there with God stuff here. There's a website called Sports Talents Agency of America, S-T-A-A, where they use, you know, if you're young, you use that and get into money, blah, blah, blah. So I sent my tape in and I got a call from the guy who runs it named John Chelesnick, who said, man, we love your stuff. You're awesome. Uh, just resume wise, just having a conversation. So actually didn't hear my tape yet, but we just had a phone call and we really connected. So I said, I got to send him something and not having the background of a Syracuse and Ithaca and Oswego. I sent him a who's the goat conversation between Joe Montana and Tom Brady. That was like 12 minutes long that it didn't at seven o'clock in the middle of basketball season in Syracuse. And he hated it and it ripped it apart and said he wanted something better. And I just never talked to him again. I'm like, dude, you don't know anything. This is what people want to talk about. 10 years later, all anybody wants to do is the LeBron versus Jordan conversation. And even though it's at nausea for some people, it's the easiest tool to hit. It's the easiest number to hit. The easy button. All that stuff. I bring that up for that conversation because the LeBron talk's not going anywhere. Like LeBron is now guaranteed to be in the NBA for three more years. It's more than likely he's going to break the all-time career points scored record this season. Now, can we stop with the conversation of LeBron being a franchise-changing player? It might have been too much or too unique hype around LeBron to begin with. The difference is that LeBron could actually do it. Guys who followed or wanted to be the next LeBron, Kyrie and Jimmy Butler and others, and I guess we could put Durant in that conversation too, didn't do it. Durant went to Golden State to win a championship. Kyrie was with LeBron. Everybody wanted to be LeBron, me plus everybody else, so I get the legacy additions. Yeah, and that's uniquely LeBron. But as interesting as it is that the Lakers aren't as successful with an older roster with my guy Melo and Anthony Davis not getting any younger, I'm more fascinated by the years on this. So, Bronny James, LeBron James' son, was supposed to play with LeBron for his final season of the NBA. And if you ask anybody about this, that was the plan. 37-year-old LeBron turns 38 in December. His final season was going to be with his son. So, let's do the math here. One more season for LeBron, and Bronny will graduate. So the next season, what happens? Is LeBron going to play two seasons with his son? Is he going to retire after one season? The math doesn't add up like he used to when you're a 2023 graduate, but your dad's under contract till 2025. It feels like Ronnie James is going to college. There's reports out there from Michigan to Michigan State to USC to UCLA, and LeBron had talked about that his son wasn't going to go play in college because the athletes couldn't make money, could be a pro. But a recent report by ESPN.com had said that if Bronny James decided to play at college, he would nab something around $6.8 million in endorsements. That's his estimated evaluation if he had all the endorsements coming. The most marketable college athlete of all time. Now, not the best college athlete of all time. Not the most popular college athlete of all time. The most marketable. And that comment really does make sense, right? LeBron James got a $100 million contract with Nike before he ever played a game, and now his son is coming with far more ways to market yourself in the social media landscape of TikTok and Instagram reels and everything else. And LeBron, uh, Le I was called LeBron there. He's LeBron James Jr., Bronny James, is a gamer. So that's a whole different world to go into, too. That's what that contract means to me. Not to do the who's the goat so John Chelesnick doesn't yell at me 10 years later at STAA, but feels like Bronny James is going to college. Feels like Bronny James is going to go play college basketball after the big dunk that went viral over the week. And LeBron's okay with that. No one's going to throw LeBron out of the NBA. No one threw Jordan out of the NBA when he's playing for the Wizards. Or all these other Kobe in his final season. Carmelo, my guy, still sticking around. Dwayne Wade didn't even get thrown out of his band for some of those last years, too. That's what this means. 
that Bronny's either going to college or LeBron stick around for a lot longer than he realized. I just can't make every WWE segment a love fest for Triple H. I just can't do that every single week. And the next week I could do it, and the next week I could do it. I'm not going to do that. I'm going to talk about NXT this week. We're going to leave the WWE logo up on it on our visual sign. Let's just talk about NXT and what that is. Because NXT for a while here was the most watched show, at least for hardcore wrestling fans, it felt like the most aggressive, passionate, maybe a better term here, show for pro wrestling fans from the days of Shinsuke Nakamura to Bobby Roode to Cesaro and Sami Zayn and Kevin Owens. There was something really cool about, okay, you've got the sports and entertainment side over here, but we've got this independent style, uh, underground, this is the best show around style of wrestling. And what Triple H was able to do is that he was able to bring that out. Now, there was a change, and it became truly a developmental system. And at some point, AEW started to do that. What Tony Khan, to his credit, what he did is he looked then and said, okay, if that's what's popular and getting the older wrestling fan that loves this stuff and buys the gear, talks about my product, let's just focus on their strengths and bring that over here. I love the tweet. I believe it was Ryan Satin who had the tweet who said Fox Sports contributor in the past of if Triple H was running the WWE five years ago, would AEW even exist? That's a great question. But now we can play that same question again. If Triple H is running the WWE in 2022, does NXT exist? Because if Triple H wants to bring all the cool stuff I'm talking about match styles and matchups and interesting things in the background that gets people talking. Truly weekly episodic television. Then what's it mean for NXT? Like, do you use your best recipes for random days or do you use it for the holidays? Do you bring out your best wine and booze for your best friends or just some random person who showed up and might be fixing your sink? I hope you get my comparison here. What I mean by that is that is Triple H just going to pass over NXT? Is NXT now in a worse spot than it's ever been before? Now, it's not as bad as guys jumping over barrels and doing karaoke in that, what, late 2000s, early 2010? It's not that bad. I kind of like the developmental stuff. Is that weird? I kind of like it. I like seeing the new guys, the rookies, the new platform. If you want to do the independent stuff, AEW's kind of opened it up for you. NXT's good right now fine i'm okay if triple h doesn't touch it everybody wants him to change nxt back to the black and gold to what you were used to but the trick here the interesting part about this is that triple h is saying oh you thought that was cool huh wait till you see what happens on raw wait till you see what happens on smackdown i'm the boss now i'm going to make you feel like those shows are cool again because you saw what i did with nxt in the past and that's the best business who for the wwe Cater the biggest audience on the biggest shows, the most popular shows. And then people kept coming back. I saw the report. One of the best ROM ratings television-wise in a year and a half this past Monday. Take that number for what it is. But NXT, leave it as it is. Speaking of AEW, huh? We got a little bit of Punk versus Moxley coming up. Okay. All right, Punk versus Moxley. I saw a little CM Punk. It's not Pipe Bomb, but references to pipe bomb the last two weeks right where he talked about las vegas and how it was the best moment of his career now he follows it up the next week talking about why does moxley always end up being the third best person in a group in comparison to the old shield in comparison now to the i want to call him cesaro castagnoli and regal group the blackpool combat club i'm forgetting one of the other guys Wheeler Yuta, thank you. Who am I thanking? Uh, Wheeler Yuta in that group as well. So good. AEW's got stuff going on. I like Jade Carhill messing around with the acclaimed on Twitter. These guys crack me up on there. Some real s strange pictures trying to steal Rhea Ripley's gimmick of people being whatever. Uh, yeah, so look, the, the Tony Khan criticism was addressed on the internet that it felt like he was having a, a temper tantrum about how he was acting backstage, and that's cooled off a bit now. So. The Tony Khan criticism may not be as there as it was before. I was going to do like another three minutes on just ripping Tony Khan, but I've, you've heard my take on that. I'm more excited about the return of Kenny Omega. Like we had Omega coming back. That was my thoughts over the summer that just AEW is missing too many stars. They're missing Punk. They're missing MJF. They're missing Omega. Now your stars are coming back. 
And with the interesting competition here between Triple H and the shows getting better on Raw and SmackDown, how, if at all, will that alter the ways in which all elite wrestling handles their shows? Are they just going to go business as usual? Are they going to watch Triple H and see what they're doing and try to copy it? Are the fans of AEW quickly going to notice, hey, hey, you're copying. You're doing the same thing they are. I don't know what's going to happen with AEW. It's still going to be entertaining. It's still going to be good, but the competition is going to step up, and it's going to be interesting how they handle it. Because AEW... It's got some WCW feel to it sometimes where they added a bunch of older guys to the roster. Now they got to find a spot for them. And as that roster gets bigger and bigger, it starts to feel like the NWO of the late 90s and early 2000s. That who's on the team again? Who's out there again? So AEW is going at it right now. Punk versus Moxie is a great way to start this thing off. Still building young stars. Still finding out the ways in which they as the overall the trio championships and I was floating out there as well too that's a different cool unique idea that's happening in AEW so they're getting innovative they're trying stuff out they're bringing back some old school and new school I'm fascinated by how AEW now steps up their competition but right now so far so good at Tony Khan I like what the future looks like for your overall corporation is corporation organization let's just call it AEW UFC this weekend. How about that? Yeah, UFC card coming up this weekend. Some good stuff on this card. UFC 278 live from Salt Lake City, Utah. It's been a minute since the UFC has been in Utah, but they are back this Saturday. The main event, Kamaro Usman versus Leon Edwards. Round two of this one. Second time we're going to see these two go at it. Oh, let's start with the main event, right? I know you usually should build up to it, but let's see someone do it. Let's see somebody beat Usman. I don't, I don't know. I, like, who is it? Like, Kobe Covington's battles with Usman have always been great. We've had a lot of fun watching him rise to the top. Uh, Kamara Usman's in a weird spot where it's, what's left? Jump up in weight class? You haven't lost in a really long time. He's talking about putting himself in the conversation. One of the GOATs, the greatest of all time. We've had those conversations with a few people now in the UFC. Kamara Usman's in it. Like, who else would he have to beat? He has had the title, what, since 2019? 2018? Tyron Woodley? There's another time where he has a title fight in there as well? Yeah. Like, dude, he's been able to do it all. He's entertaining. He can talk. He's got charisma. The Nigerian nightmare. The conversation we had with him a few years ago at Radio Row. I became a fan of his. He's a fun fighter to watch. Good. Kamaru Usman, especially for big-time MMA fans, that's your guy. Like, if you are into the UFC and if you're buying pay-per-views, if you're a fight fan, he's on the list of guys you want to buy. So, main event with him in it. He puts on a show. He continues to say, hey, let's start talking about me. He's the flat-out best pound-for-pound fighter in the UFC. Why can't we have that conversation if he wins? Why not? Give me that conversation. Also, in this pay-per-view, Luke Rockhold. Remember Luke Rockhold? Remember Luke Rockhold's face just getting pounded in, man. How for Luke Rockhold still allowed to be out there? Rockhold just bashing dudes, man. I liked watching Luke Rockhold. It feels like he's been in it for a minute, though. A long time. He had that battle years ago, right? When Anderson Silva lost back-to-back fights, and Luke Rockhold has that main event. I believe it's on the McGregor card as well, where... He finally wins the championship. Man, we are dating ourselves on this. Is this 2015? Chris Weidman, it was the McGregor card. Look at that. I still got that. So, yeah, Luke Rockhold's still out there doing his thing. Want to see if he can continue to carve out a really good career. He's on this card. Oh, remember we mentioned the McGregor thing, and that's why it triggered the memory? Aldo on this card as well, fighting an up-and-coming fighter who might want to make a name for himself on this as well. So we got some... Marquee names, some fighters who have been around for a while. And you know what the best part about that is when you have the familiar names, somebody can jump up and steal the spot. Could Miranda Maverick be the person who steals it? Could be. Keep an, keep an eye out on her, right? UFC 278. I like the card. Pretty balanced. Go through maybe the overall cards for the UFC in 2022. I wouldn't be shocked if we talked about this upcoming weekend's UFC card. is one of the top five cards of the entire year. We're going to close out with college football over-unders. You saw the tease on social media. College football, our first bets of the year. But before we do that, go out and support Lily and David Fine Jewelers. This is what I want you to do. If you hit on one of these college football over-unders, give it a little bit percentage of the cut to Lily and David Fine Jewelers. Buy that certain somebody special in your life. 
something nice that fits her style, her fashion, and more. Whether it's the engagement ring, I know from experience where I bought my ring. Two for one wedding band sale. Guys, if you've already gotten engaged, take advantage of that deal. Or maybe it's a wonderful piece of an earring. Maybe it's a, a necklace, something that fits her style. And guys, you might not know exactly what that means. That's okay. Alyssa, David, and the crew will help you find exactly what she is looking for. Family owned and operated business. Lily and David Fine Jewelers have been helping people across the capital region. And now they can help you. Route 50, the shops of Wilton. If you're listening to this, maybe you're driving up to Saratoga. And you hit the trifecta, the superfecta, and be like, yo, let's just give our guy Gaz and Gaz the media some love. Let's stop it at Lily and Team Fine Jewelry. At least say, hey, we heard the podcast. We love it. What can I grab here for the missus? Really appreciate it if you go out and do it. Love our friends over at Lily and David Fine Jewelers, Route 50, the shops of Wilton. You stop in, tell me you said, Gaz told me to come in here from Gaz and the Go, Gaz and the media, all that stuff. Lily and David Fine Jewelers. Shout out to Alyssa and David. All right. College football over under. Hicks, I am so excited. Next week, we get to talk about week zero. The week after that, we give week one picks. We get our predictions for conferences. It's going to be heavy college football. Ne- oh, that feels so good. Heavy college football talk next week. I might even get an early release on Gossip and the Go next week. All right, four. Two overs, two unders. I always feel bad picking the unders against college athletes, but it is what it is on this. And also, a reminder, you're going to get this here on Gossip and the Go. We usually stay away from the brand names. So if you're a fan of schools like Alabama, USC, LSU, you know the brand names of college football. We try to stay away because everybody and their mom's going to give a take on those big games. We try to get you the money that you're going to win. We had a good year in college football last year. Let's keep it going. So some teams off the radar that you might want to play some money on. Let's start with my favorite overplay of the season. That is Charlotte, the 49ers. You can find Charlotte at four and a half right now. Over under Four and a half for Charlotte. Think about this. They were five and four last season. They end up losing their final three games of the season, miss a bowl game. Bowl games are important for those lower level schools. And if you're not making your bowl game, it sits in those juniors and sophomores' minds of that was our goal all season long. We couldn't finish it. Now you're going to get me at four and a half for Charlotte. I love that. Now, here's the bigger part about Charlotte. Remember, Conference USA is all over the place now. A bunch of teams are in, a bunch of teams are out. So that Conference USA that we were all used to in the past, yeah, we're not getting that same type of schools this year. So Charlotte over four and a half wins. Let's do our other over. That is the UNLV running Rebels. Now we're not talking Jerry Tarkanian, Larry Johnson, Grandmama. We're talking about the new field, I know Notre Dame's on the schedule, but it's it's insane to think about what UNLV had happened to them last season. UNLV went 0-6 in one-score games. 0-6 in one-score games! So you're telling me if an extra point goes a certain way, a field goal, a turnover, that all of a sudden that team could have three more victories? Four more victories? Look, the number is four and a half that I have sitting here for UNLV. But if you can sit there at four and a half again and take the over on the run in Rebels, I would do it. You would just think they're eventually going to fall into place and win more games with some changes out there in the desert. So that's another good play. I want to talk about the same theory we had there for Charlotte. Upperclassmen remembering those losses, taking it into the offseason, finding out ways to win out in the Mountain West. UNLV. Take the over for them, four and a half this season. Just a reminder, by the way, if you're wondering where we're getting these lines from, DraftKings, our friends over at DraftKings, so that's the app to use. More information on our partnership with DraftKings coming up. They teased what's coming up. Oh, man, I cannot wait to share that in two weeks. So, again, overs, college football, Charlotte, UNLV, both four and a half, both play the over. The two unders here, Georgia Tech. Uh, shout out to our guy Tito in Syracuse. He has been preaching this all season long. He's probably going to yell at me for trying to jinx his pick right now. Three and a half is still the number. I'm going to get it now. I know it's going to get to three. And it's going to make it a lot more difficult. How are they going to win a game? Their defense stinks. They're terrible. They have no offense. They have no recruits. I cannot believe the number's at three. Now, here's probably the reason why it's at three. It's because it's in a large market like Atlanta. And Atlanta's a top 20, top 25. They've got big games. Georgia Tech. But the old triple option back in the day was actually able to be a consistent contender in the ACC. This is one of the worst teams in the country this season. Under. 
Now, it's not even like UConn either or like UCF. Or I should say USF. UCF is very good. USF has been struggling recently. South Florida. This is a big name school. And the ACC has consistently been able to pump out 9, 10, 11 bowl eligible teams who just think you'd luck into victories, not Georgia Tech. Under. Play the under in Georgia Tech and play the under in Nevada. I don't get this Nevada thing. Like Nevada lost an NFL quarterback. Nevada is a marketable team as well because we've seen them win year after year and they've been in the mix as a 9 and 10 win season and all of a sudden Nevada's sitting there guess what the number is again one more time four and a half so someone looks at Nevada like whoa, whoa Nevada the team that used to be Boise State the team that's posted 9 and 10 win seasons the team that had Jordan Love four and a half they got nothing they had 10 percent 10 percent not 90 not 80 not 70 the offensive line has only played 10% of the snaps over the last year for Nevada. So I have no offensive line, no starters coming back, a loss of a quarterback, a more competitive Mountain West, under. So there's the plays. Three four and a halves. Charlotte over four and a half. UNLV over four and a half. Nevada under four and a half. And Georgia Tech under three and a half. College football preview coming next week with more bets. Cannot wait. Talk to you again next week.